Today's Bible reading is from Acts chapter 10, verses 30 to 48. Cornelia answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by the people, but the, by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everybody who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Very nice to see you. And if you're visiting and you're with us for the first time, a especially warm welcome. My name is Rupert and I'm the vicar here. And you join us on a good Sunday. Every Sunday is a good Sunday. But today we start a new sermon series, and it's about sharing our faith. It's about talking about Jesus. So let's pray together that God would have something for each of us. Father God, we thank you for the scriptures, and we thank you for your presence with us this morning. And I pray that you would speak into our lives, that you'd make us receptive to your word today that you'd help me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Come and make yourself known to us, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You don't have to have been a follower of Jesus for very long before you get to know that we're meant to share our faith. If you've been walking this walk for a bit, you know this very well. And we generally agree that's a good idea, not least because Jesus tells us to share our faith. And he sent out the 12, didn't he, into all the world to make disciples. So the fact we're meant to be doing it, I think is a given. If, if I asked, and I'm not going to ask, for a show of hands, who agrees that we're meant to be sharing our faith, put your hand up if you don't think we're meant to be sharing our faith. I don't think anyone's going to put their hand up and say, oh yeah, yeah. We shouldn't be sharing our faith. So far, so good. But here's the challenge. In real life, we don't do it. In, in real life, we find it very, very difficult. In real life, it sort of slips down our agenda to a place of sort of barely having in, any impact on us at all. In fact, there are two topics that as a, a preacher now for many, many years. There are two topics which I think um, get the kind of response from a congregation very often. Yes, <laughs> we agree with you, 
but you're not going to see any action. Or yes, we consent, but we're not going to change. And those two topics are evangelism and tithing. They put the fear of man into people. Well, that's not what I intend to do. I, I don't intend to put the fear of man into people. But in this little series on evangelism, I realized the place I need to start is a bit further back than most talks on evangelism start. I really wanted to give this talk the title, We Need to Talk About Jesus. There was a book called We Need to Talk About Kevin. Well, we don't need to talk about Kevin but we do need to talk about Jesus. But I thought, if I start there, it's not likely to have a good result. I want to tell you two stories, and um, bear with me. Many years ago, when I was working in Cambridge, uh, I decided I needed to get out of a Christian bubble and mix with more people who were not Christians. I thought it'd be good for me, and hopefully good for them. So I joined a golf club. And um, the trouble was I hadn't played golf for some years and uh, it, golf hadn't been very good anyway. So I decided I'd have a lesson. And on one particular afternoon, <clears throat> I went and paid up my cash, my hard-earned cash, for half an hour with the golf pro. Now, I don't know why, whether it was something appalling she saw in my golf swing, or whether it was a bad hair day or whatever. <clears throat> but after about 10 minutes of golf lesson, she sort of vented, and she spewed out with a certain amount of anger and a lot of earnestness, a lecture that went roughly like this. Look, it's no good you just coming out to play golf once a week and expecting that you're going to be absolutely marvelous, and then having one lesson in five years and thinking you're, it's going to make all the difference, because it's just not going to happen. You need to be out here on the practice screen hitting a golf ball for one hour twice a week and playing regularly. And of course, as she read this kind of riot act, I nodded. Yes, absolutely, I'm sure you're right, of course. How naive of me to think you could just turn up and play. Of course it needs a lot of practice. Yes, yes. Who would have dared say anything else? I tell you, if you'd have seen her with a weapon in hand, you'd have agreed too. But inside, as I was processing, I was thinking, no way. You think I'm going to give more hours to hitting a white bit of plastic? You've got to be nuts. I've got better things to do with my time. And also, I was processing thinking, and it won't make any difference anyway. Even if I do give uh, two mornings a week and play five times a week, I've, I've got a rubbish golf swing. Nothing's going to change. I simply didn't really believe her. But I wasn't going to say that, so I just said yes, pay my money, and never went back. But the second story is slightly different. Borderline revolting story, spoiler alert. Uh, Rupert goes to see the dentist. Now, my excuse is this is many, many, many years ago, so please picture me much younger, more ignorant, and silly. And there I am in the dentist chair, and you know the experience. When you're in the dentist chair, you're very vulnerable. And then you open your mouth, and they look inside, and they start probing about, and you start jumping around from time to time. You know? And there I was laid on my back, mouth open, lights my eyes, and she's prodding about. And then she says, Rupert, do you floss your teeth? Now, that's the equivalent of a vicar asking you whether you've had a quiet time this morning. You know, you feel very, very vulnerable. I sort of had to admit the answer to that was no, back then. I had to admit it because there was probably 20 years of accredited grime in between the crevices, I don't know. But she then told me, quite politely actually, why I needed to floss my teeth, the difference it would make, and what would happen if I didn't floss my teeth, etc., etc., etc. And as I left that dentist's room, my behaviour changed. <laughs> and from that day, I've always flossed my teeth. Now, what's the difference between those two people? Well, I think I believed the second one. I believed I could do what she was telling me to do. I believed life would change for the better if I did what she was telling me to do. And I understood the cost of not doing what she was telling me to do. 
This series on evangelism really needs a talk which I'm giving now called We Need to Talk About Talking About Jesus. We need to be persuaded, me as well as you, that this is an enterprise worth doing. Not just something that we ought to do, I think we've all clocked that, but personally persuaded, actually my behavior needs to change, I really, really need to get into this. And it's not easy. Too many talks on evangelism give the impression that for some this is just a walk in the park, a doddle. That if you're that kind of person, all you've got to do is kind of put your head outdoors and people come running to you saying, tell me the way of salvation. And, and friends, that, that really isn't the case. And that's why most of us don't do it. John Stott wrote, the first book he wrote was called Our Guilty Silence. And it's, a, it's an incredibly astute title because it sums up where most of us begin. And things haven't got any easier since John Stott wrote that book. You know, back in the days that he wrote that book, some 40 years ago, Christians used to be regarded in this country as rather quaint. They sometimes kind of got the name God botherers, that kind of thing. They were a little bit eccentric, and it was a minority interest, people thought. And they might turn up, a Christian might turn up at a university city um, and have a harmless debate, really. A bit of a nuisance. But today, to be a follower of Christ is perceived quite differently. A, a follower of Christ is perceived as having really rather dangerous views. Not eccentric, but dangerous, horribly at odds with society and corrupting society, whatever the topic, so that the Archbishop of Canterbury finds himself on the front pages when he talks about immigration and refugees, so that any Bible-believing Christian who talks about sex and gender and marriage finds themselves opposed, so that people watching the coronation last week are amazed and rather surprised and not altogether happy that it had such a high level of Christian content. Well, they argue, how can such a minority group still have a place in services like that? All I'm saying is the background hasn't got easier. So we really do need to be motivated if we're going to open our mouths to talk about Jesus. Press pause and think, has it ever been easy to talk about Jesus? Did the disciples not get it in the neck when they talked about Jesus? Didn't Jesus get it in the neck when he talked about Jesus? Ah, so we begin to see that actually this is something of a constant. Peter, the disciple at the heart of this incident that we had read from Acts chapter 10, he flunked it big time when he gets an opportunity to talk about Jesus. Three times he denies him. So I think I want to shelve the myth that there ever was a golden age of evangelism where things were that easy. And I also want to put on one side and discredit the idea that some people are just born evangelists and it comes easy to them and we can leave it to them. I guess in my lifetime, the most prominent evangelist is Billy Graham. And in one of his uh, biographies about him, the author says that Graham told him Whenever I enter a restaurant now, any public place, I can see mockery in people's eyes. I can see people punch and nudge each other and they whisper among themselves, watch out, here comes Billy Graham, be careful, don't get converted. And he added, I'll be very happy when my time comes to go to heaven. It is hard to talk about Jesus. And churches and individuals that begin wellness actually go into decline if they're not reminded after a while. I guess one of the most outstanding churches in the States some years ago was Willow Creek Church just outside Chicago. And Bill Hybels, uh, the founder, wrote a book about how he planted that church. And right in the heart of the bloodstream of that church was evangelism. And its first few years, it boomed, boomed, boomed. And then I remember hearing a, a, a talk given by Bill Hybels, a senior pastor, after about seven years. And he said when they reviewed their activities, they didn't think that their priorities had changed. But when they actually reviewed what was going on, very, very 
new Christians had found faith in their church, though their church had grown, the, the actual evangelism, the actual bringing people to Christ had, had really stalled. And it caused him to ponder and rethink. And he, he decided actually that from then on, they would put a disproportionate amount of effort into evangelism, this talking about Jesus, Jesus business, because it's so hard and so contested. And actually he posited an idea which I think is worth thinking about. Why wouldn't this area be contested if it's people going from death to life? There is something to be said for this is stirring up spiritual warfare and apathy would be a very effective tool if you were on the other side. So I want to talk in the remaining time I have about motivations for us in the hope that we will want to be equipped and prepared to talk about Jesus. And if you track the headings that I have, you'll see that there is a theme uh, that runs behind the headings and I leave it to you to work it out. But the first motivation I'm not going to spend very long on at all because it's so obvious. A motivation to talk about Jesus is simply the times we live in. The times. They're difficult times. There is a sense that we're living on borrowed time. We're playing out our lives in extra time. They're certainly uncertain times. And I don't know what it, you need to look at to see evidence for this. It could be the war going on in Europe. It could be climate change. It could be the recent pandemic. It could be something far more local. <clears throat> but everywhere you look, there is a sense of fragility. There is a sense of a need for some good news. And one of the reasons I'm not going to flesh that heading out anymore is because we don't come to church to be depressed. So you read the newspapers to be depressed, not come to church to be depressed. So I don't need to elaborate more, but the times that we live in cry out for some good news. And those of us who know Jesus, we have good news. So the times should motivate us. Secondly, we need to talk about Jesus because he is the news of the world. Right at the heart of this incident, of Peter going to visit Cornelius is something that is so big we could almost overlook it. It was a complete surprise to Peter. But at the heart of his story and by the end of his story, Peter says, the penny's dropped. This news about Jesus is not just for a small little fragment of people, the Jewish people. This is for the whole world. This is for the Gentiles too. And he ends the story by saying, now I realize, in verse 34, not quite the end actually, he says, I now realize how true it is that God doesn't show favoritism or partiality, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Has it occurred to you that you might possibly be holding back from sharing the news about Jesus because you've decided in your mind that a certain group of people either don't need to hear him or life's going on fine without him for them. But that just isn't true. The news about Jesus is for everyone right around the world. For Peter, the struggle was to imagine that God could possibly have good news for a Roman called Cornelius. For Paul, it was a struggle to think that Jesus could possibly love him, a persecutor of the Christians. And I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised if during the course of today, there's someone or some people who come into this church and they're sitting down and you might be one of them, I just don't know. And you, in your heart of hearts, you're thinking, I can't really believe that God would want me to be one of his friends. I can't imagine that. Well, at the heart of his story is God saying, well, please do imagine that. Because Jesus is good news for everyone who will receive him. But another reason, or uh, yes, I think another reason that I hold back from sharing my faith is, quite honestly, I'm tempted to believe there's a whole strata of people who actually don't need the good news. 
And to be brutal about it, I look around and I see so many people, you don't have to walk from five minutes in any direction from this place, really. And judging by outward appearances, people look terribly fulfilled. And they look as if they're leading enviable lives. They have more money than they've got time to spend it. Probably more possessions that uh, they'll have time to play with. Life looks very sorted and successful and enjoyable. And all this leads me into a place of silence, really. How can Jesus have any relevance to them, I wonder? And of course, when I start to think like that, I've derailed before I've begun. Because we know, actually, that outward appearances don't tell you much about what's going on on the inside. And the good news that we're being offered here is God wants a relationship with you. And if you and I can receive that, it will turn out to be more precious than any wealth, more precious than any success. Some time ago, I remember just in conversation asking somebody, I think I was on a Christian house party, and I asked this person what her story was. How did she become a follower of Christ? And she told me, well, actually, Rupert, my husband had a very good job and um, a good salary, and we lived in a lovely house, and I had a good job too, and our children were all doing well. Outwardly, we, we looked like we had it made. But inwardly, I was unbelievably unsettled and depressed even. And one day, I had to stay at home because the boiler was broken and the gas man came to fix the boiler and he did and he fixed it. And then we had a kind of conversation while he was in the house. I don't suppose he was in the house, she said, in very long. And our short conversation, but somehow in the middle of that conversation, he ended up telling me about Jesus and he left me a copy of one of the accounts of Jesus' life and I read it and I became a follower of Jesus. That's how she became a Christian. So when you ask yourself, how can Jesus have any relevance to people like this, I wonder, one answer could be, well, he could put the wonder back, for starters. We have to speak out because we're guardians. We're guardians of God's good news. Not everyone knows that, knows the good news. I happen to think that the reason so many people, so many friends of mine and friends of yours, are not followers of Christ is because they've got the wrong end of a stick about what to be a follower of Christ is about what a Christian is. They haven't so much rejected Christ as walked by on the other side, just sort of told themselves, it's not for me. But the thing that they're telling themselves is not for me is not actually the thing that is for me. They have a false sense of what it means to be a Christian. Maybe they're yet to meet someone they know and respect who is a follower of Christ. Or, and this slightly makes me shudder, or maybe they have met us, followers of Christ, but we haven't yet revealed our true colours. Because a lot of people out there, a lot of your friends and mine, I think, think it's all about church. But it's not about church. It's a bit like a story, I like the story, about a man who put his head around a church. He obviously didn't do it very often. He came into a church building and he said, is this the church of God? And the vicar said, good heavens, no, this is the Church of England. But, of course, it's not meant to be a contradiction. And sometimes people have asked me in what they think is a put-down, but I think it's rather a good write-up. You're not one of those Jesus churches, are you? To which the answer is, yeah, well, I hope so. But it shows you that there is a disconnect, a, a wrong perception that some people have of what we're trying to talk to them about. At the heart of this message, which is entrusted to us, which we're guardians of, is what Peter says in Cornelius' house. You know the message God sent to the people, good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Let's just stop for a second and just um, take stock. I want to try a story, a, a, a hypothetical story out on you. Suppose I said to you, 
If you go through that barrier over there, we'll open the door, and you just walk into the side chapel, you could have a look inside there, and you'll see something that could change your life forever. Would you go and have a look? Well, actually, the answer is probably no, because it, it, it sounds a bit far-fetched. It, it sounds a bit over the top. It sounds unlikely. So based just on that kind of a question, would you like to put your head in there? You might see something that would change your life forever and for good. Probably not. But if I change the question slightly and, and put it like this, if you go through there, you will see something that has changed my life. It's changed the life of millions of people around the world, and it still is changing the lives of millions of people around the world. Would you like to go and have a look? None of the odds are slightly more favorable because you're talking from personal experience and you've got something to back it up. You might still say no, but you might venture to have a look. Let's change it slightly more. <laughs> Not to go and look in what's in that room over there could leave you extremely vulnerable and in a dangerous place. Would you like to go and have a look? Sometimes, People need to understand that what potentially is on offer is so big, could change your life so much for the better, it's worth having a look on the off chance it's true. To illustrate this point, it's actually easier to reach for a negative rather than a positive. Years ago, I worked in Salisbury, and just outside Salisbury was the UKLF, the UK Land Forces headquarters. So we were surrounded by soldiers. And when 9-11 happened and the Twin Towers disintegrated to the ground, all, all the soldiers were saying to each other, all the army was saying to each other, OBL, Osama bin Laden. Because they knew all about Osama bin Laden. They knew his potential for evil, for damage, for harm. Today, it's important we know a bit about Putin because we need to know his potential for harm. You can't afford to be ignorant about what's going on. Well, flip the coin over. We can't afford to be ignorant about the good that Jesus could do in our lives because we could be missing out so much. And you and I are guardians of this news. Now, next week and following, I'll be talking more exactly what is that good news, what is the gospel, but I'm just flagging it. It has tremendous potential. And it's been entrusted to us, Jesus' followers. And of course, at the heart of the good news is the Son, Jesus. What do you know about him? And Peter will say here to Cornelius and the people in the room, you know how God anointed Jesus and how he went around doing good and healing all that were under the power of the devil because God was with him. I'm going to set you a little bit of homework but it's homework to do in private on your own. It's homework that I did myself for weeks and weeks and weeks because I actually was sitting in this church and heard someone give a talk about the importance of sharing our faith. And at that time, I was an insurance broker in the city. Very, very junior insurance broker, but all the same, that's what I did. And I, I understood what they were saying about the importance of sharing our faith, but I thought there's one big problem I can't even say the name of Jesus to myself without blushing. I kind of stammer. I kind of look awkward. I just, it, it doesn't sound good. So for about a month, uh, every single morning as I was shaving, I would try and rehearse the name of Jesus without stuttering or making it sound odd. And my homework is really that, uh, not that you will shave, <laughs> but that you find a way of practicing because it's not an easy name get out. But we'll never get far with sharing the good news until we can spit it out. And Peter says we're witnesses of everything that he did. I don't often plug podcasts, but I'm going to plug a podcast and we might have a slide that can go up. I've got into listening to a podcast along with many, many hundreds of thousands of people called The Rest is History. It's it's one of the most popular podcasts, which is to say it's not very highbrow. 
and it's very, very entertaining. And over Christmas last year, they did a two-parter on who is Jesus. Now, these guys talking, um, they're not Christians. And yet, one of them says, this is without question the most influential life that has ever been lived, Jesus Christ. And um, as they talked about Jesus, it was absolutely scintillating. And what was scintillating was the interest of the character of Jesus and what he said and what he did. And as I say, they're historians. They're, they're not believers. And it made me see we don't need to be embarrassed about talking about Jesus because he's totally, totally fascinating. Um, hopefully, yes, there we are. If, if, um, if you've got a phone that takes pictures, you could scan one of those QR codes and it might be useful to you. One of them's a uh, BBC link and the other one's an Apple link, but you might listen to your podcast through other means, in which case you just need to Google Jesus Christ, the rest is history podcast and, and that'll come up. Dostoevsky said about Jesus, I believe there is no one lovelier, deeper, more sympathetic and more perfect than Jesus. And I say to myself, not only is there no one else like him, but never could be anyone else like him. It's important people get to connect with him, even if they decide afterwards not to follow him. I'd like them to know the one they're walking away from. And lastly, we need to talk about Jesus because God has told us we need to telegraph this news all around the world. Using the message translation, here's what Peter said to Cornelius. And we saw it, we saw it all. Everything Jesus did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem where they killed him and hung him from a cross. But in three days, God had him up alive and out where he could be seen. Not everyone saw him. He wasn't put on public display. Witnesses have been carefully handpicked by God beforehand, us. We were the ones there to eat and drink with him after he came back from the dead. He commissioned us to announce this in public, to bear solemn witness that he is in fact the one whom God destined as judge of the living and the dead. Friends, it's incredibly important that we break cover as followers of Christ. As I, as I look around this church, I don't know what all of you do, but some of you work in large organizations. And I've discovered that when in organizations, people at any level, but especially senior levels, but at any level, let it be known that they are followers of Christ. It legitimizes other people who are also followers of Christ to come out of the woodwork. It has a repercussion effect, a boomerang effect, which is exponential. And you'll discover all sorts of other people, they too are followers of Christ. And suddenly the little lights begin to shine a bit brighter. So take the risk, take the risk. My hope in giving this talk has been to be very, very real together, for us to realize we as individuals and we as a church need to buck our ideas up, that we might just be going a bit to sleep. And we don't want to, we don't want our light to go out. We don't want to just maintain. God has not told us, just follow me and keep quiet. We want to be so full of God and the Holy Spirit that actually it's easy to talk to people about the difference Christ makes. It's easy to be motivated to do it because we know that God walks with us. Because we see changed lives all about us. Because we understand and believe it will make a difference. And it will make a difference. This is what God is calling us to do. Let's pray. Father God, in just a moment, we're going to celebrate that you laid down your life for us. We take a moment to acknowledge that often we've hushed up this news, we've privatized it, and we've gone shy about you. Now, we can't 
just shake that off in a second. We need to ask your help, Lord. And we do. We pray, Holy Spirit, you'd forgive us the times that we have dropped out of this commission. And we pray that you'd equip us again, put us on our feet, and lead us step by step so that we can lead others into your path and they can discover life, life to the full. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.